It's time for another round of Hot GPT. Today's topic is essential marketing strategies for startup success. All right, Pat GPT, start generating. Now, why did I bring up marketing? Because this season, we have a lot of folks coming on who are great marketers. But marketing is not, for a lot of people, it is not something that is obvious. So we have, for example, coming up on Thursday, we have the founders of Varsity Headwear. And it's an amazing company that has used marketing in a really smart way without spending too much money, because you can just blow money in marketing. I'm talking billboards and Times Square and expensive events, like what they call an activation, where you're giving people free stuff by renting out some, like, I don't even know, some storefront in the West Village in New York City or in Covent Garden in London or something like that. You can spend a lot of money on online marketing. You can You can just really blow cash. And you start to see this with companies when they launch their product, And then they give the marketing team a budget and then it just gets blown. And two months later, the money's gone and people are like, what did that get us? That is not the happy place. That is the bad place that you want to avoid. And so that's why I wanted to take this on because having studied marketing, having used marketing myself for my own things, which I hope you enjoy my marketing, and having talked to all these amazing founders, I wanted to get into some of the ways that marketing can be used for startups cheaply. Some more cheap than others, but relatively cheaply. That's what we're going to talk about today, right after this break. FOMO. FOMO. All right, we're talking about essential startup marketing for founders or for founding teams. That's what I want to talk about, and I got four things for you. Now, the first one, not rocket science, but it's so hard to do well. And so it is kind of rocket science, and I recommend you don't do it on your own. It is digital marketing, targeted digital marketing. We're talking social media, search engines, email marketing, stuff like that, using tools like Google Analytics and social media analytics to understand your audience's behavior and preferences. Now, here's the thing. This used to be the easy thing to do. You could come up with any product, buy Facebook ads, figure out who wanted it, figure out what it cost, and as long as you made more money on the product than what you spent in marketing, you could just put more and more money and basically just arbitrage the whole thing. That's a lot harder now. It's a lot harder because the platforms don't let you target in the same ways. And so digital marketing has become much more fraught than it was in the past. And also like people just are experiencing things in different ways, right? Facebook, which used to be the place where everybody hung out. It's not the same. It's kind of like an empty shopping mall. And so this one, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an obvious one in terms of how to get the most out of it. But what I would say is two things. Number one, work with a professional here. You need to get away from the place where you're doing it yourself. Get somebody to help you with it. And number two, invest wisely. The beauty of this stuff is you can test stuff with low cost investments. I've done it myself actually. And see if you're actually getting anything. And stay away from the vanity metrics. Like if you're trying to make sales, just getting a bunch of followers on your Instagram that never click through to a sale, like it feels good because you see that follower count going up, but that you cannot eat that for dinner. You need to actually have some sales. You need conversion. And so that is the key. Conversion, conversion, conversion. What are you actually investing to get when you do digital marketing? And if you do that, it can be a great strategy. Number two, content marketing. Now this is what podcasters do, among other things. You get blog posts, you write those, you make videos, you do a podcast. A brand obviously would do a podcast to promote itself. You could have an ebook. It's a way of giving a potential customer relevant content and then hopefully build a relationship with them, build some credibility, and hopefully drive conversions to sales. Now, this is one of those things, though, that I think... It makes a lot of sense, but there's a thing you want to avoid here. And that is the feeling that you have to be everywhere. Like if your brand is launching and you have 
a podcast, an ebook, you have all kinds of content on your site, you're doing all this stuff, you're gonna spend a lot of time and energy and you're not necessarily gonna know what's working or even what people want. And I think it's more powerful to focus here. Don't try to do everything. And also stay away from being generic. Like one thing I see with content marketing, which just stinks, is you know you see people start some company and then they just write some crappy blog post on ChatGPT that nobody needed. Nobody needed that blog post. Okay, and maybe they're trying to get SEO and people to find their website and some of that is understandable, but try to give people something they can actually read and learn from and enjoy. Don't just go through the motions and give them more stuff. We all have enough stuff. That is really fundamental. So like figure out what does your customer actually value and how can you give it to them in a way that actually does build trust and and makes you credible and it isn't just a, a sort of lazy that's really dangerous and it's a waste of time. Number three, influencer marketing. Now this is obviously an interesting topic, right? Because this influencer marketing space, well, it used to be kind of, I guess like very obvious go-to and everybody was doing it. But now consumers have kind of caught up with the trend and they get it. And so it's a little less impactful. But what I would say here, let me flip the script, is influencers can look very different than just trying to go after celebrities. And when I think of influencer, I think about somebody who influences decisions by their real connection with the product more than the fact that they're rich and famous. So for example, if you are making a product that has helped people, say it's a medical device, or say it's, a, for example, um, clothing, like a bra that is for somebody who lost their breast due to breast cancer, and you feature real life customers who use that product and that you're helping, and they're willing to go out there and talk about their experience, that's amazing. That is so much more interesting, relevant, heartfelt than just simply getting some celebrity. And plus, if you're a startup founder, unless you raise tons of venture capital, you probably won't get that celebrity anyway. That doesn't mean you can never get a celebrity because guess what? There's so many celebrities now that you can probably find somebody relevant for not that much money or give them equity, give them shares in the company. That happens all the time. I was on the board of a company where we got a very famous sitcom actor to be in a TV commercial and we pay the guy 50K a year, which sounds like a lot of money until you think about, it was actually a really good ad with somebody who people love. It's just that he's older, doesn't get those calls anymore and he wants to make the money. So there are some ways that you can get good people. Just look, think back to 80s sitcoms and track down their stars. That's how you can get celebrities on the cheap. Finally, Community building. Community building is so cool if you can make it happen. And I'm talking about, we're gonna have on the show, as I said on Thursday, the founders of Varsity Headwear. And what I love about what they do with that brand is when they opened up a shop, they had a pop-up in New York. They did a little event that was full of Norwegian people, which is cool because it's a Norwegian brand with Norwegian food and stuff. They do these events at department stores where they're engrave. They can engrave your hat for you with your initials. I have mine. Mine says FOMO because, you know, obviously. And it just creates this feeling of community with the brand and to the point where I became Instagram friends with one of the people that I met at these events who actually worked for the company and then through him was able to get connected or through one of the women who was at the pop-ups who's in the marketing. That's how I got connected to the founders and invited him on the show. And now I know the founders. And by the way, you could know them too. They're really friendly guys. So reach out when you are, uh, when you are a, a founder, reach out to your customers, engage with them, give them places to convene. It doesn't cost that much money, but it's incredible how people who love your brand will show up and you know what they do? Then they make content and upload it to social media and it's free advertisement for you and it tells people who you are and what you're doing and it's just very powerful. All right, those are my four ideas. As you see, I took some classic ideas, but I gave them the old Pat GPT spin based on my own experiences. So I hope it was useful. If you have thoughts, ideas, or suggestions, reach out to me at Let's Connect at PatrickMcGinnis.com. On Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis and on Twitter, that's called X now, sadly, 
at PJ McGinnis. All right, everybody. I will see you on Thursday with another episode of Formal Sapiens. Until then, take care of yourselves, FOMO Sapiens. Pat GPT, stop generating. FOMO. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.